welcome back everyone. Um, we've got three 15 minute presentations coming up here. Kia ora koutou katoa, ko Fiona Lamont, koutou ingoa. Hello everyone, I'm Fiona Lamont and I'm a team research services team leader at Te Tuma Herenga, Libraries and Learning Services at Waipapa Tamata Rao, the University of Auckland. The next presentation we've got coming up for you is maximizing the power of community and technology in supporting open access advocacy. It's been presented by Sally Murray Walsh and Ginny Barber of Open Access Australasia. Sally is currently a project officer at Open Access Australasia and is on a six month contract developing educational resources for Open Access Australasia. She's creating a variety of online materials that will be available via the Open Access Australasia website. These materials will assist Open Access Australasia's priority of establishing Open Access Australasia as the authoritative regional resource of Open Access. Sally's prior work as a research liaison librarian at the University of Newcastle means she is familiar with the difficulties practitioners face when promoting Open Access amongst researchers. Joining Sally is Dr. Ginny Barber, the Director of Open Access Australasia. Ginny is well known and is one of the three founding editors of PLOS Medicine and has had 20 interesting and sometimes frustrating years working in academic publishing, open access, research quality and publication ethics in the orchid. And I'm going to hand you over to, to Sally and Ginny. Great, thank you very much for that introduction. So um, it's great to be here today. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Uh, uh, my name is Ginny Barber, as I said, I'm the Director of Open Access Australasia and Sally and I are presenting uh, this talk together. So before we start, I would just like to acknowledge the lands that I'm on, which is of the Turrbal and Niagara people, who are the first nation owners of the land in Mianjin in Brisbane, and to pay the respect to their elders, laws, customs, creation, spirits, and understand that where I work has always been a place of teaching and learning. Um, so first off, just to talk about Open Access Australasia, in case you're not familiar with it. Um, uh, we had a great introduction at the beginning, uh, a great talk before from Dr. Cathy Foley about uh, her work on, Chief on Open Access. And I, I think it feeds very nicely into that kind of work that we're gonna, try, we're gonna talk about today. Um, so Open Access Australasia is a diverse uh, membership organization. We've got 28, um, member, member organisations across Australia and New Zealand, 28 universities who support our work financially. Um, we also have affiliate organisations, Creative Commons Australia, Toa Toa in New Zealand, Alia, ADA and Wikimedia Australia. Um, and the work that we do is, um, is all supported by these groups and we also involve as part of what we do the, um, the members as, as uh, kind of consultants to the work that we're, we're putting forward. We were previously Open Access Australasia, we became, sorry, previously the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group, I've forgotten almost how to say that, we became Open Access Australasia, Australasia in 2021. Uh, we have an executive committee which is chaired by Martin Borshut, who's the university librarian at UNSW and our executive committee is also drawn from our members. Um, and we uh, have, we're a pretty small organisation, so myself, Sally and Sandra Fry, who many of you may know, she sends out our webs our um, up webinars and uh, our newsletters. Okay, so next slide. I just wanted to um, touch on the principles that uh, drive our organization. And these were something that we uh, reaffirmed last year. I think it's really um, relevant in the light of what the chief scientist uh, just said. I think equity and scholarly communication is a really critical part of, of what, we, what we aim to do. It's incredibly important that as we move to a more open access world, that we don't lock out from publishing and disseminating research the people that were previously locked out from accessing research. Um, and a key part for us for that of that is the diverse ecosystem of open access approaches. So that ranges from, you know, sure, the lar large publishers, but also the small society publishers, the really innovative experimental publishers, um, the ones that are supported by universities and repositories and other related types of initiatives such as preprints service, the, the true sort of bibliodiversity that we need to see in open access. Um, okay, so what did we do in 2021? Well, 2021 was quite a busy year for us. Uh, we um, uh, changed our name, we changed our logo, and we changed our website, which as many of you will know, if you do anything like that, that's a pretty uh, dramatic set of things to do in one year. 
but we now hope that our, our website really does act as a set of uh, resources that anyone can uh, freely use. It includes a set of directories, for example, a list of open initiatives across Australasia, and you're very welcome to have a look at it and contact us if you think that we've got anything that's missing from there. Um, we also include, for example, uh, uh, submissions to um, government inquiries and international inquiries on open access, because advocacy in the end is, is the really core part of what we do, in, in, as, in addition to the community building that you'll hear about in a bit. Um, so up here is also a snapshot of some of the things that we did last year. So we ran Open Access Week in collaboration with a group of um, organisers from across the region. We had more than 1,700 people come um, register and more than 1,000 people actually attend the events that we ran in OA Week last year. So it was a huge interest from across the region, which was, was really fascinating. We ran a webinar series which had a diverse range of topics, ranging from, ranging from repositories through to um, open access within the law. Um, uh, area. Um, we did a lot of advocacy work, um, including with the chief scientist, but we're also for involved, for example, with um, the final finalising of the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation, which was adopted by all member countries, which includes Australia and New Zealand at the end of 2021, and is going to be a very important piece of work for us going forward in shaping work that we do. Um, but what we also got was strong indication from our members the need for interactive, adapt adaptable resources. As we know, we can't travel as much as we can, so we can't deliver face-to-face -face webinar, face-to-face -face, um, workshops. Um, so hence the appointment of Sally in the project officer role to develop those resources. And uh, it's really included in enthusiastic participation from our members in development of them. So I'll pass over to Sally um, to do the next part of the talk. Thank you, Ginny. Alrighty, so none of the achievements from 2021 would have been possible uh, without the work that had been previously done. So luckily I jumped into the role in August and was handed uh, an entire amount of uh, materials that had been researched and created by practitioners earlier in the piece. In particular, the 2020 practitioners uh, who are listed up on the board there. Um, and they created uh, you know, an array of materials that really helped me walk into the job and understand what was needed within like the first week, which was fantastic. So a big thank you to them. Uh, some of the work that they did included journey mapping and personas, which I found really, really helpful, which you can see one of our um, personas up here, um, to identify the needs of the community and what, you know, what was the feeling about open access uh, in the current climate. So the, uh, the needs that were I was able to identify really easily was the need for resources and in particular resources that ensured reusability and adaptability for practitioners because everybody has different ways of approaching things and um, you know different KPIs to essentially meet so they need to be adaptable. Um, as well, there was a feeling from the research that I read that open access, while it's been around for a while, it's somewhat still mysterious uh, and a simultaneously worn out discussion, but also people want to know more. And so it was a very kind of interesting space to sort of step into. And I felt like I really needed to bridge that gap for all of those kind of uh, those parties in our community. Uh, so all of the work that I've done, I've done in line with our 2021 practitioner group, which is a bit smaller this year, um, but they've been fantastically resourceful um, and helpful with feedback and really worked with me um, as we've created a whole bunch of resources and activities. So with Open Access Week 2021, fast approaching in October, uh, in the committee uh, of organisation for that, uh, that week, we'd reserved a time slot for an interactive activity Dot, dot, dot. And that's all we kind of had listed on the on the uh, piece of information. And so uh, I was allowed to kind of use my creative uh, spidey senses and create something interactive and a little bit different. So I love innovating online as much as we're really stuck at the moment with COVID to being locked as to only online, which of course, when you pushed into a corner, it's not always what people want to do. But I do see a lot of um, interest and a lot of amazing tech out there to really allow us to innovate online and create really interesting sessions. I also really wanted to embrace and sort of lean into the fact that majority of our practitioners and our community are massive nerds because let's be honest, most of us work in a library, most of us are a little bit book obsessed. So I really wanted to kind of make the most of that and really make this activity enjoyable. So I took some inspiration from a Dungeons and Dragons session, which Ginny was actually a part of in 2020, which was called Walking the Rocky Road from Policy to Compliance, 
a live adventure. And this is where this graphic is from. Um, I wish I'd been able to take part in it or uh, knew that it was happening when it did happen uh, because it sounds like an absolute hoot and a fantastic activity that ran really well. Um, so if you haven't checked that out, I'll put a link in the chat later. Um, check out the article by Heather Staines. It was really, really good. Uh, so I took inspiration from this activity and I also looked at other online virtual activities that were being done around COVID to really you know, heighten that interactivity. And would you believe it, there's not a lot for professional settings. There's plenty for educational and especially primary schools, but professional setting a little bit less. So with a massive leap of faith, uh, I decided let's do a virtual escape room and Ginny agreed. So we got to, we got to working on that. So what exactly is this virtual escape room? Now, if you are joining us tomorrow, we look forward to seeing you. If you're on our wait list, we hope to see you soon. Uh, don't worry, we're not gonna spoil anything in this presentation. Um, so what exactly is this, this virtual escape room? Probably heard about it, but what actually is it? So we'd planned to run the entire open access week via Zoom, which was great. It's a, you know, a tech that most people are used to now. And so I constructed the session around utilizing the features of Zoom. So things like breakout rooms, screen sharing and chat functions, we're all really familiar with, but we really wanted to kind of make sure that those were key elements to the escape room. Furthermore, I chose Google Forms to display the content of the escape room and the Google Form acted as the walls, floor and ceiling from which to escape from. So, how the heck did we pull it off? Uh, we hoped and prayed, no, we, uh, we planned quite a bit and did a lot of practice, which was really good. Um, so this session is conducted by a fantastic team of moderators or libguides, that's what we call us, ourselves in the, in the session. Um, and our libguides navigate our players through the Google form as I said, the, the room in which we're, we're in, um, from, from which they need to escape out of. So the Google form contains open access related questions, riddles and puzzles and the places to enter the answers. After the activity is finished, all the 30 minutes is reached because of course there is a time limit as all good escape rooms have. Uh, once you've reached that point, all groups rejoin in the initial big Zoom room together and we run a facilitated discussion about all things open access that we've either learnt, we've questioned, um, we've you know, had fun with within the activity. And the final twist, and this was a really key point for me making this activity, uh, is that the escape room we actually bestow all the materials to our players. And so then they're able to use and adapt and then run uh, the session with their own um, cohort, their own audience as a form of open access advocacy. And so this to me was a way to answer that we want resources call um, and provide them something quite detailed, but also quite adaptable. So what were some of the lessons that we learned from this activity? And here's a lovely smiley picture of all of us after the first escape room that we pulled off. We were very excited about it. Um, so firstly, we learned that uh, our moderators tend to be a little bit competitive, uh, which isn't a bad thing uh, because each of the moderators are really responsible for hosting the room and really gaining that engagement where in a, in a physical sense, in a virtual, uh, sorry, in a physical escape room, you would have uh, things to interact with to keep the audience engaged. We don't have that as much in this setting, so we need to make that host a really big part of each of the rooms. It's really important to practice the story and the technology to make sure that everything runs smoothly, uh, which is obviously key in any kind of online activity. Uh, and we capped the numbers for our first session because we really had no idea how this was going to be received and how we'd actually go about running the session and if it would be successful. Uh, but we found that capping the numbers is actually a really key part of the session because it provides a smaller and more in, a more personalised experience for our players. So we capped the numbers between about five and seven people per room. And that means that the host is then able to really engage with each of the, the players um, and make sure that they're you know having a good time and enjoying the session and lastly most importantly and I'm sure we all know this check your clues and your links because things do change on the internet and so we have had to make a few last minute adjustments um, but way better having a last minute adjustment than something not work in the session so what is next for our community uh, well some big things more big things uh, so currently I'm finalizing the open access course open access 101 
It's a combination of self-paced learning, community forums via Slack and self-evaluation. It's a professional development course that will only be available currently to members of Open Access Australasia. Within the course, there's resources that have been created, all resources have been created with a CC BY license, which then allows our practitioners to distribute, adapt and reuse as they see fit. The course aims to ensure a level playing field for all our Open Access practitioners, no matter how seasoned they are but we're also providing them with these adaptable resources for their own open access advocacy. And with that, I will hand back to Ginny. Thanks very much, Sally. Uh, you can see we've had a lot of fun with doing this stuff. Um, I just, so as well as the tech of stuff, the, what really is the core of what we do is our community. And we're very proud of the way that we've been able to convene and support an open access community in this region. There's lots of ways you can get involved with it. So you can sign up for our newsletter, uh, you can follow us on social media. Um, we have a monthly community of practice, practice in Australia um, and we, we join the New Zealand community of practice, which is uh, completely awesome. Um, we also um, would absolutely support, if you're not a member of our organisation, you'd like to be, we'd love to have a conversation with you. So please have a look at our website and, and get in touch. Um, I'm very happy to have any questions. Wow, thanks, Sally and Jenny. That was such a great explanation of that. I did wonder what that was for. <laughs> I'm so mad I missed it last year at Open Access Week 2021. Um, so the website, the new website is great. So I highly recommend people to check it out. Uh, and I'm just looking at the Padlet for questions and there's no questions there at this point. Does anybody want to post something in chat? Um, lots of positive feedback on the escape room. Sally, thanks for your work, Sally. Escape That's room. great. That's when we participated last year. That's fantastic uh, to hear. We um we loved running it and hopefully we'll be running it a few more times and, and I hear there is quite a big wait list. So hopefully we'll we'll get to everybody there um, and they'll they'll get to experience it and then take it and uh, deliver it themselves as well, which is all part of it. Oh, that's well, really great. We'll post all the links actually either in the chat and we can put them in the Padlet as well. So feel free to explore those. That would be really great. Thanks so much. Okay, guys, don't forget you can put your questions, you can still put your questions into the Padlet because um, Sally and Jenny will be looking at it. Oh, here we go. Do you have a date when your next session might run? Well, it's actually tomorrow. I can tell you. <laughs> but there's a wait list for this this one. So you can still sign up for that and be put on a wait list for when the next session comes in. Um, one thing, I, one thing I'll just say for that is we're very keen for people to adapt and use these and we, you know, we're kind, kind of aware that without giving too much away, um, there's sort of perhaps slightly more in Australia than New Zealand focus to this. So anyone who wants to adapt it for, you know, a more local use, would love to see them doing that. So please feel free to, once you've done that to, to jump in and adapt it in any way you think. I definitely think that'll be happening. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And, yeah, and we're not about this. Yeah, when, we're not uh, we're not handing it and and saying we'll never talk to you about it again as well. Uh, we're we're more than happy to to chat to you if you guys are curious or you you get stuck or you're trying to do something and you're not sure it's possible. Um, you can always reach back out to us. We're more than happy to to chat with you about the escape room. Yeah, totally. That's great. Okay. Well.